Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And yesterday I did a video um, and I got some comments back on it and said, oh, Pat, I think you're wrong. Um, I, I spoke on how there was the possibility that uh, Riley Strain, because he was found without his pants and his cowboy boots, could have attempted to remove them uh, when he when he fell into the river um, because they they weight you down and they feel heavy and it's hard to swim. And people do that. They do remove clothing in order to be able to swim. Um, but I had some interesting comments on that and, and I thought they were justified. Okay. Uh, one was they thought the river water was too cold to, for him to be able to react like that. Uh, some said this cowboy boots would be too tight so he couldn't get them off. Um, I think those are perfectly reasonable comments. And I will admit, um, when I woke up yesterday morning and I, I had said that for, for me as a profiler, when I looked at the facts and the variables, I'm going to get into what facts and variables mean. I felt that regardless of the fact he did not have on his pants and his, his, his boots, that this was still an accidental death based on facts. And so I got all these people saying, no, it's impossible. He, you know, obviously he was uh, somebody undressed him and then put him into the water. That's obvious. Um, and people were saying even the, even the currents couldn't take his clothes off. That's ridiculous. So I responded to kind of a, well, you know, <laughs> probably responded too quickly to the, the, the concept that there is no way that the clothes could be removed from his body uh, without somebody else doing it. I apologize for that. So today I want to go through the whole issue of facts and variables to be more clear and more to help understand the different issues involved. Because this is really very interesting about facts and variables. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times people ignore facts and jump on a variable. And what do I mean by a variable? Something that we don't actually know why, or we don't actually know if that is actually true. Okay. And therefore they say, well, because of this one thing, for example, uh, his bank card was found on the ground. Oh, it's a homicide. How do you come to that conclusion? Because a bank card is found on the ground. Are you ignoring the other facts? Like he had no trauma to his body. That's a fact. An absolute fact. He had no trauma to his body. And he was also found in the river. When you put those two things together, the majority of the time, unless there's something very, very unusual, that person drowned in the river. Um, now, what's his bank card doing on the ground? I don't know. That's what's called a variable. A fact, let me go back to the fact again. Fact one, he was found in the river. Fact two, he was near the river when he disappeared. Fact three, well, there was no trauma to his body. And that put together indicates accidental drowning death. Now, bank card on ground. Why was it there? Well, I don't know. It, there's, a, there's too many variables. A variable is something that could be this, it could be that. And... We just, we don't know what it, what it actually means or how it plays into everything. Could he have been reaching into his, could he have had the bank card separate from his wallet? Um, I've had, I've had cards separate from my wallet. I've put things in my what a pocket. I was my, thinking I'm going to use this and I put it in my pocket. Is that possible? Did he in a drunken state open up his wallet and think, oh, I'll go get some money from the ATM and drop his, drop the uh, card on the ground. I don't know. Is it possible he dropped his entire wallet on the ground and somebody picked it up and looked at it and took the wallet, just looking through it and dropped the bank card and walked away with it? I don't know. But here's a fact. Those are all variables. But here's a fact. His cards have never been used. That, generally speaking, eliminates robbery. He wasn't assaulted in a robbery so that they could take his wallet, use his bank cards or his credit cards or whatever. They weren't used. So why his card ended up on the ground, I don't know. Then people say, where's his wallet? Well, that's another variable. He was stumbling around in different places. We don't know where he went into the river. I'm going to get to that variable. Um, did he drop his wallet someplace? And nobody's just found his wallet yet. Did he Did he go get to the shore and 
drop, and drop his wallet into the water before he even fell in? Or did he fall in? And after he fell in and the pants came off one way or the other, the wallet's at the bottom of the river. We don't know because those are all variables, things that we don't have actual solid information about. Uh, so I don't know. But you can't hang your hat on murder because, oh, my God, his bank card was found on the was found. And you can't hang your hat on, oh, my God, his wallet is missing. Therefore, somebody stole his wallet. That's 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 not a fact. It could happen. It's a variable. But we don't know. That's not those are not those are things you consider. So let me under, teach you how if you're a detective or a profile, you consider many things. And along the way of an investigation, you can change your mind if, if actual facts come to light. Then, then, then you say, okay, now I'm going to add this in. This, is, this, this might change the way I think about something. Um, so far, the wallet has not appeared. It's likely at the bottom of the river. Um, there's no particular facts that anybody robbed him. So th that's just a variable that we don't understand. Now, where did he go into the river? Well, he went into the river. That's a fact. How did he got into the river is, a, is something we don't know. Now, I pointed out a couple of things in my last video. Uh, one is he fell into the river. Two, and why did he fall into the river? Let's look at, look, let's look at another variable. He's intoxicated. Uh, we don't know yet. We haven't got a toxicology report back. Was it just alcohol? Some people think he was roofied. Who knows? Uh, but he was obviously not in exactly the best of states. Um, did he just get, lose his way, get confused and stumble around this area here or wherever and pitch into the river? Yeah. Did he go to urinate? This is a big thing with dudes. Now, women, <laughs> this is not, women don't usually fall into rivers because they're trying to urinate. That's not where women urinate. Women tend to go into, away from rivers into bushes. That's what we do because we want to hide. <laughs> Men are like, oh, yeah, river, cool. <laughs> You know, that's what you guys do. So that he would go to the river to urinate is not un unlikely, um, which also puts another variable into his pants, because if he unzips his pants and then falls in, his pants are now looser. OK, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So he fell into the river because he just stumbled in. He fell into the river because he was urinating and lost his balance. Um, I don't think suicide is an issue here you know, some people could go there, you know, Hey, he, he just decided in the middle of this life is worthless. And he jumped into the river. I, I don't think so. I mean, that, that, that would be taking it. You know, you have people wanting to be wanting it to be murder on one side, but so far nobody said, Oh, you jumped into the river for suicide. That's, nobody believes that one. And I don't. Um, all right. So, so those are some variables. We don't know. Here's another variable. We don't know where he went into the river. Was it at this space there? I think it's, this is a picture and I don't know it's accurate. Maybe where his bank card was found. Did he go in here? Did he go in some other place? So here's a, a really interesting variable because I do not know the Cumberland River at the location in Nashville. Um, I, I looked it up as much as I could uh, to understand where he could go into the river. Um, and what, if he went into the river in certain locations, how deep was it? These are variables again. Um, the, 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 uh, the, how cold the river was, is supposedly, uh, I'm looking right here, um, uh, it could be, the, the air, it depends on the air temperatures. They think on March 8th, the temperatures was, uh, were as low as 56 degrees, uh, making the water te temperature possibly to be in the 50 degree range, which is very chilly when you fall in. And that could cause somebody to the shock of it to to be able not to be able to deal with it. Hypothermia can set in really quickly, so that could affect. Could he remove his boots and whatever to try to swim out? Yeah, that could affect that. Um, absolutely. Uh, but then, but then the variable comes in is how deep was it in the location he fell in, or whatever. Some people say, well, maybe he was pushed in. Well, maybe he was. You know, we don't know. Um, but let's say he was out around the homeless encampment and somebody, he was staggering around. Somebody went like this. Okay, could that be murder then? Well, it could be, but it's a variable that we can't prove. Ended up in the river. It's not as likely a variable as 
he just fell in. But we could add that. Can't prove it probably unless somebody confesses. But okay, so I'm just doing a kind of a, <laughs> as you can see, a kind of a, I'm just thinking through things out loud so that you can see what detectives and profilers would go through as they're trying to figure out what happened. But what, what I want to point out so strongly is the difference between facts and variables. Okay, so I don't know where he went to the river. I don't know that the police know where he went to the river either. Um, did he go into the river where it was immediately 20 to 24 feet deep, which would mean he would have to swim to get out of the river? Did the location he fell into have any kind of branches overhanging that he could grab onto? Because that would be a variable. Uh, oh, it's like, oh, I fell in the river, uh, but I've got a branch here. Is that possible? I don't know. Um, did he fall into a place that actually wasn't that deep? That he There are areas in the Cumberland River, and I don't know where they are because I don't have <laughs> all that information. Uh, theoretically, I'm, I'm just putting this out there so you can understand variables, not because it's true. Let's say he fell into a place that wasn't that deep, but it was muddy and cold. Did his, could his cowboy boots got stuck in there? Let's say he was trying, he was trying to urinate and he pitched in and then his boots are stuck in there. And he's like, oh man, I can't, I can't get my feet out. He gets his feet out of the boots. He staggers, tries to stagger up to the, the shore. I mean, to the, yeah, to the shore. And um, his pants are half down. And then he loses his balance, falls back in, ends up, move, the current takes him away, pulls the pants off him. Is that possible? Sure. One of the things I want to point out about the issue about um, the pants is if he did go to urinate uh, and he's unzipped the pants, he's a very thin guy. Let me let me show you the picture again of him and how thin he is. Um, he's a he's a he's a skinny dude. Uh, there he is. He's, and my my guess is just I'm just going to say this. I don't think I think I don't think he has much of a butt. So he's skinny. If you undo, uh, if you unzip. And you're very thin. The easy ease of the pants falling down is is much more likely. Um, have you ever seen those videos where some guy has his, you know, he wears these really loose pants and they're like on his hips, and the police are chasing him, and as he's running away, the pants fall down to his knees, and then he falls over. It happens. Why? Because the pants are extremely loose, and they they're easy to fall down. So with Riley, I don't know how. Now, supposedly people say they were kind of skinny jeans. I don't know. This is not a variable. So, and of course, was was the zipper open or not open when he went into the water? That's another variable that we do not know. Um, so it's hard to know, would those jeans be easy to come off of his body or be pulled off of his body while in the water? I don't know. Um, let me point out something about the cowboy boots. So somebody pointed out that cowboy boots are generally really tight. And that was very reasonable. Okay, so when you all come up with some ideas, this is one of the wonderful things about a group working on a case, uh, in detectives. You have more than one detective working on a case. Um, I totally believe in getting input from many, look, from many people. Why is that? Um, because we don't all have the same experiences. Uh, my granddaughter does do Western riding, and she's had some boots but I didn't buy them. Her mother did. <laughs> and her feet keep growing every day. So I honestly don't know whether the boots fit or don't fit. Um, but she bought boots for riding. That's a specific purpose. So when you have cowboy boots, you can have cowboy boots because you're, you're on top of a horse dealing with the cows. You're going to buy a specific kind of cowboy boot for that. All right. Uh, if you're horseback riding, you might buy a different cowboy boot for that express purpose. Some people buy cowboy boots for work because they like the way they are. Um, the kind of cowboy boot that um, Riley had, let me tell you the kind that he had. Um, because I, I looked, I was curious. Um, he was reportedly, and this is, I believe his parents stated this, wearing square-toed Justin cowboy boots when he went missing. And this is what those boots look like. They're not real high. And they're like that. All right. How hard are the boots to remove from the feet? By yourself, because you're desperate. So I oh got my feet feel like oh, I've got weights on them. I got to get these boots off or that the currents would take the boots off you. 
Well, here's the variable again. I don't know why he has the boots. Did he have the boots? I don't know if he does horseback riding. I looked up trying to find out more about this guy. He's from Missouri. He's not exactly from Texas, as far as I can see. So he was going down to Nashville. Mm, that's kind of a place you want to look cool. Maybe wear cowboy boots. Did he buy the boots specifically because he was going to go to Nashville? Or did he own the boots prior because they looked cool on him? Um, were they new boots? Were they old boots? Did he buy a boot in the proper size? Did he buy, Did he try on some boots and say, man, these things are too tight, and he preferred a looser boot? Variables. I have no clue. So the boots could be very difficult to get off. The boots could be much easier to get off than we think. I don't know, and neither do you. And the only people that well might know if they were if they recovered the boots they might know what size they were uh they can talk to his family and his friends find out when he bought the boots are they new boots are they old boots um what size were the boots i just don't know and that's the point it's a variable so when you're looking at all the possibilities it's hard to determine let me let me talk about going back at the river again let's say he fell into the river and he struggled. He, he managed to struggle to some extent to, to shore. Like I say, there's mu the muddy area and he, the mud, he the pulls pulls on his boots and he gets his feet out of the boots so he can get on shore. And and then he's on shore and he staggers along or he, sta he, tr or he tries to get up there and then he falls back in. He could theoretically fall in the river twice. Uh, some people will jump up and say, oh my God, that's ridiculous, Pat. The problem is we just don't know. Variables in some of these cases are really difficult. Um, they really are. We just don't know. We don't, first of all, we don't have the toxicology report back yet. So we don't have the facts on his condition. Some people say he was too inebriated to be able to function in any way if he fell into the water. I don't know because there was one point we talked to a police officer and the police officer didn't notice that he was particularly having that much of a problem, but yet he was stumbling along in other times. So we do not know. I assume he's pretty inebriated, but hey, here's another weird variable. What if he, he staggers along in the bushes, he passes out? I pointed this out in the last video. He could have passed out and, the, and some homeless guy goes, nice boots, and pulls the boots off him. He says, nice pants, pulls the pants off him. And then he wakes up a couple hours later because he's he went, you know, passed out, wakes up. But let's say he woke up with still his pants and boots on two hours later. Nobody knows when he went in the river. Let's say it was two hours. I know he's a little bit more aware, a little less drunk than he was two hours prior or whatever is wearing out a little bit. He still st gets up, staggers over and says, I'm going to take the urinate because now I've, you know, I got, I got to pee. And, and he does and he falls in the river. He would have more abilities to function than he would uh, two hours prior. Now, you can say I'm making up a whole bunch of stuff, but that's the point. There, the variables are so many in this case that if you want to determine people who are not part of the investigation, people who do not have all the facts, want to determine that he is murdered outside of the investigation, what I see a lot of people doing is grabbing onto one variable or the other to say he's murdered. But the facts remain accurate. What are the facts again? Fact is, he was found in the river. Almost all people found in the river have drowned, okay? Now, you can have that little part that says, okay, maybe he's pushed in the river. Maybe he, maybe people found him unconscious on the ground and thought he was dead and put him in the river. Or maybe he was dead and they put him in the river. Is that possible? Sure, but that's not homicide. Well, pushing would be homicide. Um, however, uh, we don't have any proof of that. That's a weird variable. You can throw it around, but unless you get some facts on that, it, you know, really stop doing that. <laughs> um, but the fact is there was no trauma to his body. And this is the big fact. I can't get past. That is the huge fact. Generally speaking, when you have robberies, now he was highly intoxicated. So somebody's going to jump out and say, well, he's too drunk. He couldn't have fought back. But then they didn't need to kill him either. They just take his stuff and run away with it. Um, he wasn't assaulted. He wasn't shot. He wasn't stabbed. There was no blunt force trauma. So there is no proof of 
this being a homicide, this being murder. And when you put the things together, why the police say they still believe, regardless of the fact he didn't have his pants and shoes on, regardless of how the pants and shoes were removed from his body, whether he removed them, somebody else removed them, or the currents removed them, the fact is there's no trauma to his body. And so that makes it very much the likelihood it's an accident. Now, let's talk about manner, the difference between cause of death and manner of death. Okay. Cause of death is what exactly killed you. If he was, if he went into the river alive, the cause of death would be drowning. Um, a secondary cause of death could be alcohol served to him. That the alcohol caused him to be in such a condition. He fell into the water and then died of the primary cause of death, which was drowning. If somebody roofied him, that would be a secondary cause of death. Now they could be charged. Uh, probably with manslaughter because I wouldn't necessarily know that he was going to go fall into the river, but because they created a, a condition for him that put him in, in a situation where he was out, not able to control himself, that would be a secondary cause of death. And you could, you could charge that person. I, I would say manslaughter. Um, uh, that's cause of death. Now, manner of death, the manner of death is, essentially how the person ended up dying. Was it an accident? Was it suicide? Was it, was it homicide? Um, what was it? Um, a manner of death is a little sketchier, by the way, uh, because what that is, is you cannot want, well, you can sometimes 100% prove manner of death. How, do, how does this happen? Well, let's say a guy is shot uh, 20 feet away uh, and he's got eight shots in the back of his head. <laughs> I'm going to say, and I think we could probably be pretty 100% sure that he was murdered. But what happens if he shot in the chest, close range? Well, somebody could have just put a gun to him and shot him in the chest. He could have turned a gun on himself. Although men, if it's a man, they usually go for the head. But Women more, more into the chest than men. They like to keep their faces. So the man shoots himself in the chest. Is that possible? Yes. Um, so, and you have to look at whether there's fingerprints and all that kind of stuff. Um, third possibility, the guy's playing with the gun. <laughs> That's an accidental death. You could have homicide, suicide, accidental death. How does that, how is that determined? Well, it's determined by somebody who analyzes this and it's a combination of the medical examiner and the detectives. It's not always clear who puts more effort into the manner of death determination. Uh, so somewhere along the way, it becomes conclude, they conclude something and the conclusion might be that they believe it's homicide they believe it's suicide they believe it's an accidental death and so that's what ends up on the form um are they always right no because that's an opinion based on hopefully solid facts but sometimes a lot of variables that are then played into what they think happened uh, that's why there's sometimes families um, of loved ones who object to the manner of death. They don't object as much to the cause of death as they do to the manner of death because they say, hey, there's something else going on here. Uh, we don't believe that the what it is what you said it was. We don't believe it was an accidental death. We believe it was a homicide. And so then there becomes some, oftentimes fights for years between the families and, and law enforcement. And, and one of the problems we have is that Families, I said before, families do not like to believe their children died of that they would kill themselves or that they just did something stupid. So they prefer to believe somebody else played a part in it. And I, I had somebody write me an email said, that's just not true. I, as a parent, would never go there. I would prefer to believe that it was an accidental death. No, I'm going to tell you, I've worked so many cases. I can't tell you how many cases I have worked where the police said it was an accidental death or, or the person took their life and the family has been fighting for decade to prove that it was murder. They've come to me to say, prove it's murder. It's clear that the police are lying. It's murder. 
And I come back after I look at everything and I say, no, I agree with the police. And then they, they call me a sellout, <laughs> you know, because it's not the answer they wanted. It's a weird human thing. So it, I understand where the family is coming from. It's just, it's very hard to accept that either you didn't know your child was that depressed and sad that they would kill themselves or that your kid, kid just did something stupid that one night. And I mean, and think about it. I'm going to say, you know, I'm lucky I'm alive. <laughs> I've done some stupid things when I was younger. I could have ended up dead. And my parents could have gone, I can't believe she did something that stupid. I think she was murdered. You know? No, I was that stupid. So, you know, as far as alcohol, drink, my God, people don't understand alcohol. Alcohol these days is even worse than it used to be. I know that when I was uh, 21, I remember the, 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 the the cocktail called Tom Collins. That's how old I am. Nobody drinks those anymore. And I would get one and nurse it for the entire night. Now people are chucking down shots one after the other. They are, they get, and women especially, uh, they can't handle the shots like a lot of the men can. And I'm surprised when I see how much they drink. Um, they can go through a night, a few hours uh, drinking beer and shots or or, or martinis and shots, and they can have a heck of a lot of alcohol in their system very quickly. Very dangerous, um, and it's ha and it's it's a big, become a big problem with young people. That's a fact. That is a fact. Um, whether that happened this particular night, we we, it, we have variables. We just don't know how much he drank, what he have imbibed. We don't know until maybe the toxicology report. Now I want to talk about the the the, the water in the lungs. Is another variable which is very annoying. Um, I talked about the fact that he might have fallen into water and had a, what's called a laryngospasm where your throat just closes up. If you go into shock and cold water and sometimes even get a, a little bit of water into your throat, your throat will close. And it's a protective thing to keep you from essentially drowning. Um, it keeps bad things from going into your lungs that shouldn't be there. And it's terribly frightening. And I, I explained how in my last video, I'll, I'll link that, um, how I've had laryngospasm. I've had an about 10 episodes of laryngospasm. Luckily, nothing in the last half a year, maybe a year now. Um, terrifying. And I've had it drinking water. <laughs> I've had it eating a, a sour, sour dummy thing. I've had it just, I was eating a salad one night and it hit me. I've woken up with laryngospasm. It's terrifying. You think you're dying. You think suddenly Jack the Ripper, <laughs> not Jack the Ripper, that would be a Boston Strangler. Suddenly the Boston Stranglers, you feel like you're being murdered and you can't breathe and and it's ter very terrifying. I have learned methodologies to, to deal with it, which is put your fingers behind your ears and put your head back is the best push, push in and put your head back if you've got laryngospasms. And you have to remain calm. It's, it's terrifying, but eventually it releases and then you're okay. Um, but you know, when you, so this happens some, to some people when they're going, going to the water. Um, there's a lot of arguments. I pointed out last time too. scientifically, some say that was absolutely a thing that happened. Now, some people are saying, no, it doesn't happen. You know, science changes all the time. So can you believe science? <laughs> well, not necessarily. Um, but he was supposedly, now we have this a variable again, because it's not a fact at this point, uh, that I'm doing the video today. Now it may become a fact in a week when we get more information, but there was some claim that he did not have water in his lungs which is why laryngospasm was one of the possibilities that prevented water from going into his lungs. Um, and, um, but we don't know yet exactly because it's not actually a fact yet. So we have, does, did he have water in his lungs or didn't he? We just actually do not know. But let's say there is no water in his lungs. So we have the laryngospasm possibility. We also have, which uh, one, one, um, uh, one pathologist pointed out, let me, let me just say this. I don't know who this guy is. Dr. Michael Graham has examined dozens of bodies pulled out, pulled from the Mississippi River throughout the 40 years he spent as a St. Louis medical examiner. So he's got a pretty good history there. The recently retired pathologist said the absence of water in the lungs of a body that has decomposed for that long, for the time he was in the river, is not unusual. A victim could still drown and be found without water in his lungs. Okay, there you go. That's one pathologist saying this. I'm not saying he's accurate, but I'm saying that's what he's saying. So either water never got into his lungs, or there actually is water in his lungs, and we just haven't heard the proper report, or because of decomposition, there is no water in his lungs. Those are variables. I don't know that they're facts at this point. They're variables. So 
the problem is when you have variables, it's like, it's a little iffy, you know, iffy stuff. Um, people point out, well, maybe the reason he didn't have any more as long as he was dead before he went in. And I did point that out in my last video. I said, okay, let's say, let's say he just, he, he passed away for some reason on the bank. And they're, while they're ripping off his boots and pants, go, dang, I don't think this guy's alive. And they push him into the river. Is that possible? Sure, it's a variable. It's not, it's not a fact. Unless, unless something comes to light that makes a variable then become a fact, it's not. So the problem with variables is that people jump to conclusions with every variable to say, see, clearly, he was dead before he went into the river, so he was murdered. No, that is not what that variable means. Um, it's a variable. It's, it, you can have a theory all you want, but it's just a variable. Um, what we do know, let me go back to the facts before I sign off here. The facts, he was found in the river, which majority of the time indicates drowning. Two, he was seen next to the river, so he wasn't driven there in a vehicle. He wasn't 50 miles away when he disappeared. He was staggering around literally on the river bank. So he was near the river, found in the river, and found with no trauma to his body. That is a strong indication that the manner of death, not the cause of death, the cause of death would be drowning, unless he was truly dead before he went in the river. But the manner of death would then be accidental. Now, can this change? So this is something else that before I go away again, I want you to understand. When you do profiling or, or investigating, you don't do a pronouncement that is absolute necessarily. I mean, I've had people say, well, Pat, what if new information comes in? Well, if new information comes in, I might change my mind. Because it's, it's, it's the only time you come to an absolute conclusion is when the facts are solid enough to say this exactly is what happened. Uh, when you go, for example, when you have a suspect in a homicide case, a murder case, a murder case, um, you may have a lot of different reasons you think that person murdered the other person. I've had cases where I can say, I'm pretty damn sure that's that's the right guy. But there's not enough evidence to go to court to prove it. So I, I, I can say I believe that's what's true, but I can't prove it. And neither can the prosecutor. Um, unless some other evidence comes to light that makes it strong enough to prove in a court of law. Um, so when you're looking at a, an investigation, let's back up. When you're looking at an investigation, something happens. I've been brought into uh, certain investigations where I have reviewed all the evidence that they had. Um, now, from outside the investigation, I may have one view, like in this case. I'm outside, just like all of you. I'm looking at variables, a few facts, but a lot of variables. I don't have a lot of the information that's inside the information, and neither do you. So what's happened to me many times, uh, outside of an investigation, let's say I'm, um, I'm about to go in and work with the police for the next week. I'm going to see everything they have. But before I get there, the family is telling me, I think this is what happened. All right. I, I say, I don't know. I don't know because I don't know enough yet. And I get in there. Even, oh, maybe I have some preconceived notions. Hey, maybe this is what I think probably happened. I get in there and I start going through the information. I look at the crime scene photos and, and, and autopsy stuff and the interviews. I'm like, oh, if I'd known that before I got here, <laughs> I would have had a totally different opinion. But I didn't know that. But now that I'm here, oh, my God, it's clear as a bell as to what happened. And it wasn't what I thought before I walked in these doors. So this, I repeat this over and over again, this is an educational channel, not a crime solving channel. I want people to understand how things work and how you think through things and to, to, to explore that concept. If you're going into profiling, if you're going into becoming a detective, if you just want to understand stuff, this is a good channel for that. What it isn't is a pronouncement channel uh, that, I, oh, you know, Pat Brown is hundred percent right. Or, I actually absolutely know what happened. This is impossible because I'm not inside the investigation. Uh, so all I can tell you, even as a criminal profiler, is what I know from public information. That's why I say it's it's, it's an educational channel, nothing more than that. Um, but I'm hoping that as um, they say people going into their, their future, watching my channel, and I have I have so many cases I've analyzed that they can learn from those analyses and learn how to do better analyses themselves. That's that's my hope. Um, 
and to help other people who just want to understand. Because there's so many channels out who are claim they're crime solving. They're out on, you know, they're out out in the community interfering with police investigations. <clears throat> um, some of them are just spreading gossip every single day. Um, I want this channel to be something educational and useful um, and not that. Um, everybody has a right to go to whatever channel they want, but I hope those that come here understand the purpose of this channel. Anyway, that's my thoughts on this. I, I really, I said, I spent half the night just uh, I was bugged, you know, by <laughs> the fact I hadn't really explained um, the facts and the variables and clearly enough. And I, I wanted to do that. So we will have to wait to see what the autopsy says. The police will know more about all the other variables that we do than we do. And uh, whether they, they at this point have to have at this, at this point, believe it is an accidental death. Whether that will stand, I don't know, but I have a feeling it will stand just because of, I've had a lot of experiences with situations like this and almost always it is an accidental death, except for Chris Jenkins in Minneapolis. That's one case. I will try, I will link Chris Jenkins case below. Uh, I worked on that case and um, I, I believed it was a murder and it was a rare case of a guy ending up in the water who I believed was murdered. Uh, so yes, I'm not always, obs somebody said, well, you just clearly want everybody who goes into water to be a drowning victim, for an accidental death. I'm like, no, but I do know the statistics on it. And I do know well, how it works. So most of the time, yes, it is. It, most of the time it's an accidental death, but there are those anomalies and Chris Jenkins uh, was one of them. Um, and uh, his case is still, open as far as uh, who his killer is. So they finally did, I, be, I believe the police did finally change uh, the manner of death, which was quite something because that doesn't usually happen. So, and are the police always right? No, they're not. So I understand why some parents fight on and, and some people refuse to believe it. But I want to say this one thing, stop with the corruption stuff. This, this, oh, the police, they're so corrupt. The police have nothing, no reason, no reason to want to, they don't, they didn't even know Riley Strain. He's from out of town. He's a young man who's out of town drinking. They have no reason to want to, to be corrupt in his case in any way, shape or form. It's ludicrous. Most detectives simply want to find out the truth and want to bring the case to a closure. If they thought he was murdered by some guy down, a homeless guy down there or somebody else, they would pursue that. But they're going with the facts. And so, oh, they're all corrupt down there. And, and, and that's why oh, it's really it's all being hidden. And it's oh, nonsense. Stop it, please. <laughs> and stop with the smiley face stuff as well. Because, again, this is a ludicrous theory. It has nothing to do with this case or any case for that matter. So I see stop with the police corruption. Now, there are some times when the police can be corrupt. I'm not saying that it hasn't happened. But there's zero reason here. OK, zero reason. So stop, stop us, you know, insulting the police like that. And the detectives who are working their little butts off to try to to bring this case to a clo to closure. And they feel horrible for the parents because a lot of those detectives have those same young men. They have they have they have young men as uh, sons and um, th their sons go out drinking, too. So they're like, yeah, we understand how that could happen because that's life. That really is. All right. That's it. I'm going to stop. Um, if you're new to the channel, please do like and subscribe. Uh, hit the bell so that if I do more on this case or the Sebastian Rogers case, which I've been talking about, you can get that. Um, please, please do check my playlist for all the other cases that I've analyzed. Um, if you, especially if I, you know, if you're interested in learning uh, about crime scene analysis, and also go to if you have a specific case you're interested in, go to the search engine in YouTube and put in Profiler Pat Brown and the case you're interested in. See if it pops up um, because I've done a lot of them, uh, hundreds of videos now. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here, and um, I'm I'm glad I get to come back and uh, clarify from my last video, which. Y'all had some good points on. Huh? You did. Thank you very much.